Hello, today is October 27th, 2009. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today John F. Linehan. Welcome, John. Thanks for coming. Thank you. And may I ask you where and when you were born? I was born in Lorsted, Maine, on July 23rd, 1922. And did you grow up in Lewiston? I did, yes. And did you graduate from high school up there? I graduated from Lewiston High School in 1939. And although I was a member of the National Honor Society, uh, I was not a particularly great student. Uh, and what is your current address? In New Bedford, Massachusetts. And your marital status? I am a widower. And do you have children? I have three grown children, one of whom is deceased. So. And how about grandchildren? Two grandchildren. And after high school, did you go to work? Did you go to college? Where did you go from high school? <sighs> Upon graduation from high school, I worked one year for Pepper Manufacturing because my folks uh, could not afford to send me to college, so I had to earn my first year. And the following year, I attended Bates College and also worked part-time. And did you graduate from Bates? I did uh, 11 years later. The, uh, in, while I was at Bates College, I received a, an appointment to the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis, and I attended Annapolis from 1941 until 1943. And was that your hope to get into Annapolis? Had, had you applied, or had someone suggested it after the fact? Well, I, I had applied. We all have to apply. But the, uh, I think since I was a child, I wanted to be in the military. I was always fascinated by it. And uh, so it was either applying to West Point or Annapolis. And I had two cousins older than I, about eight or 10 years older, who had attended Annapolis and graduated. And it, uh, I, I think they served as role models for me. And, that's why I applied to the Naval Academy. And when you mentioned since a child that you were interested in the middle, military, was your father in the military? No, he was not. No. And why do you think you had that interest? I have no idea. <laughs> I, think, I think most young boys are interested in the military. And, uh, so you were in Annapolis till 43. Mm -hmm. And why didn't you complete your stay in Annapolis? Well, I, I got a medical discharge in 1943 uh, when I failed to pass the annual eye, uh, annual physical exam because I couldn't pass the, the eye exam at that time. So did you feel at that point that your career in the military was over or did you have other plans? Oh no, the, the war was on and like most young men my age, I. We were trying to prove our manhood or something, I guess. And uh, after I went home, I, I think it was probably three or four days later, I uh, enlisted in the Army with the idea of uh, follow, you know, following a military career there. So. so the Army was your second choice, basically? Basically, mm -hmm. I guess you could say that. And did you have friends who also joined the Army around the same time that you did? No, no. I, I think by 1943, most of my friends are already in the service one, one way or another. So. And did you hear from them at all? No. Where did you go? Did you enlist in Maine, out of Maine? Yes. At, at the time, they had closed the list enlistments, but I, I had had a, a letter from the Army personnel in Washington 
uh, allowing me to enlist. And, but I had to go to Portland, Maine to enlist. I could not enlist in Lawston. And where did they send you for basic training? Uh, I, I did not have to go through basic training. Is it because of your time in Annapolis? Yes. They felt I had a, a good enough background in, in basic military. So having gone to Annapolis, um, what was your rank going in to the Army? Was it Buck private. <laughs> it still was the private. Yes. Um, so enlisting out of Portland, Maine, where did they send you? I went to uh, Camp Davis, North Carolina, and, uh, and they had a, an officer's training center there. And after about, I think it was probably two months, then I was enrolled in the officer's training program. And uh, four months later, I was commissioned. Uh, and what were you commissioned? A as a second lieutenant in the uh, Coast Artillery. And what did that mean for you, being a second lieutenant? <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty, pretty bad rank uh, as the officer's corps. But uh, I had wanted to go to uh, the infantry, and, but the, all of the classes were filled at that time. And that's how I ended up in coast artillery, I think. But uh, shortly after I was commissioned, I was transferred to the infantry, but then I was required to go through officers, uh, infantry officers training at Fort Benning, Georgia. And what did that entail? You were an officer, you yeah. wanted infantry. Was it similar to what the um, enlistees were going through or something a little different? Well, that's... Uh, I'm not sure how to explain it, but the no, the officers have certainly different uh, responsibilities than than recruits, uh, infantry recruits, and the most of the uh, training was for leadership and uh, troop control, et cetera. I think that took uh, can't, I can't really remember, but I think it's three or four months. And had you been outside of New England prior to all of this time? Well, at, at Annapolis. And mm -hmm. What was Georgia like for a New England boy? Do you remember? Not, not really. I, no, I think it's pretty much the same anywhere you go, I think. And good people and bad people. And, and did you befriend a number of people while you were in leadership and troop? Control training. Yeah, you, you you form good good friendships, but I never. Uh, I'm not sure what the word is, but I, I I never kept a close association, and particularly after I left the post, I I did not keep up mm -hmm. in any correspondence with anyone because there's too much going on. So you were busy during the day. And during the night, usually, too, so. During the night with? You're, when you're in training, you're, you're basically in training for 24 hours a day, because mm -hmm. a lot of the training is night training. And because uh, during a war, there's no, uh, they don't knock off at any time, so. So how long did you stay in Georgia? That was. Uh, I don't know whether it's three or four months. And, uh, and then where did you go? Then a, a handful of us were assigned to train troops. So I was one of those, and I was assigned to uh, Camp, uh, Camp Roberts, California, training infantry recruits. So. Looking back at some of the interviews we've had, some of these troops that you've trained have interviewed, and some of them have good remembrances, and some have <laughs> some difficult remembrances about some of the leaders that were training them. Oh, yeah. Where did you fall in that category, those categories, do you think? Well, if I were to grade myself, I'd, I'd 
fall in the, in the high grades. So that, but were, I, were no, you I, strict I got, and fair? Uh, were you tough? What was it like? I, well, I think I probably was what they used to call very GI. I followed the rules and regulations very closely. And, uh, and for that, I got uh, superior ratings. But I, I, I had good rapport, though, with the men that I was training. And uh, I, d I don't think any of them wanted to kill me, so. What, once you trained them and let them go, did you ever hear back from any of them no. when they came back to the States? No. Mm -hmm. And how long did you stay in California? Oh, boy. That's a, well, I was, uh, that was only about three or four months. But the, I was there in June of 1944 when the... Uh, invasion of Europe uh, came about and I was afraid I was going to miss the war and I could not uh, get my superior officers to, tr to transfer me out of uh, Camp Roberts so I volunteered for paratroopers thinking that maybe maybe I could get into the war before it ended so so by, by volunteering to be in the paratroopers unit, was that a demotion or not? No, mm -hmm. it was, I guess you'd say it was a sideway. I am still a second lieutenant. And, and so you had to go back for training for that? Yes. And how long was that training for uh, approximately? I, um, Doesn't have to be exact. No, I, I think that was about four or five weeks. And where did that happen? In Fort Benning, Georgia, at the parachute school. What was that like for you? What do you remember about that? Well, it's, uh, it's not normal to jump out of airplanes, uh, but the training that you get, uh, starting from the basic, by the time the, the actual jump out of planes was in your fourth week of training, and by then you're so sick and tired of make believe that you, you're ready to jump out, and uh, and the first jump is a very exciting uh, situation, and and each jump after that really is uh, just as uh, interesting, and I think we had to make four day jumps and one night jump to qualify. And you did qualify? Yes. And then what happened? <laughs> then they looked at my record uh, and uh, grades from training troops out in California, so they assigned me to train paratroops in uh, Fort Benning. Were you disappointed with that? Yes. So, so you were too good. <laughs> no. <laughs> Either that or they didn't trust me with, <laughs> with troops, but the... Uh, so you stayed at Fort Benning. Yeah, and uh, I stayed there as an instructor for uh, until night, early in 1945. And uh, I had, uh, after I, to go back a little bit. Sure. After I was commissioned initially, I was sent to, uh, Camp Stewart, Georgia, which is a coast artillery was coast artillery base, and I met an army nurse there, and we corresponded later, and uh, then when I went back to parachute school, I called on her some more, and I ended up marrying her, and I was convinced by December of 1944 that I could never get overseas, so. We decided to get married, and of course, it, uh, the way the, the government and go army usually works, uh, a couple of months later, then I got my orders overseas. And, and uh, where were you? Were you in Georgia at that time? Uh, yeah, I was, but I was at Fort Benning at the parachute school. And where was your wife? She was still at uh, Camp Stewart in Georgia, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, so I. I got to see her occasionally. <coughs> so when you got your orders to go overseas, where were you going? I beg pardon? 
Where were you going overseas? Did you know where you were going to be stationed? Yeah, well, you, I got my orders to, uh, uh, at that time, it, it, as a replacement, you get assigned to replacement <clears throat> depots. And, uh, and I can't remember what the name of it was, but I ended up uh, going over. We landed in uh, Scotland, got down into uh, England, and took transport across the English Channel and uh, went into Cherbourg, France, and, which was a staging area. And, uh, and I, the time elements escaped me. I can't remember that. That was <laughs> two-thirds of a century ago. And, uh, but I went from Cherbourg and with some, you get some processing and then I went up to Charleville Metzier, which is on the border with Belgium for some more, uh, more advanced staging area. And from there, I had to go back. I got orders to go back into France uh, to uh, Epernay. And that was the communication zone for the 18th Airborne Corps. That's when I was assigned to the Corps. And then I was flown from there up into Germany. And I believe, I, th I think it was, I'm not sure, but I think it was Julesen, Germany. And uh, because by then, uh, the Army had crossed the Rhine, of course, and they were uh, moving rapidly toward Berlin. Uh, Hitler had pulled a lot of the units from the Western Front into uh, Berlin because the Russians were right at the door. And so that the, the German army had virtually collapsed in the Western sector, there are only pockets of it still around. And uh, so that if we, the, the only question was whether we might have to jump the Rhine or whether we cross. And as it turned out, we did, did not have to jump the Rhine. So, uh, that, excuse me, the Elbe River, not the Rhine. It, it was the Elbe River. and. Uh, so we crossed the Elbe River, but we crossed it on, uh, there was, a, I think, a couple of bridges that were intact, but I, my recollection is that I crossed over on pontoon bridges and stuff. Pontoon bridges being those that the Army made? Yes, the Army engineers <laughs> set up pontoons. So on a daily basis, what were you doing as you were going from Belgium? Were you in direct combat at that time? No, 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 the combat was, just in Germany at that time. And, uh, so you were following yes. the um, infantry, that, basically, that was in yeah. going into Berlin. Yeah. I, I, if I was always infantry, but uh, in a combat zone, if, unless you're in a rifle company, uh, you're not really facing the enemy and shooting at them and having them shoot at you. Mm -hmm. uh, the forward elements, from the companies on down, sometimes battalions, uh, and plus the tank outfits and the forward elements of the uh, uh, artillery, field artillery, and the engineers, uh, those are the people who take the brunt of any, any action. And so they, they are the ones there. And the, the core headquarters where I was is not uh, usually engaged in, in that face-to-face -face combat. So, And being in these areas in France, Belgium, and Germany, so you were seeing the after effects. Yes. More. What were you seeing? What were the villages and the towns oh, and the cities like? Do you remember? The, the, the devastation was unbelievable. Uh, the, the, the first uh, notices you have, uh, pieces of uh, military equipment such as tanks, field artillery pieces, uh, vehicles and, and whatnot, you know, just uh, 
broken down and blown up on the side of the road. Uh, when we got into Germany, there were dead animals, dead horses around, and uh, the people were in very bad shape, and you could see big chunks of their flanks cut out, and, and this is what people were eating to survive. Flanks of what? Horses, you mean? Yes. Or, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and so the, villagers were having to eat horses? Yeah, horse meat. Mm -hmm. And uh, besides whatever else they could get, I guess. And uh, the people, of course, Germany had been at war for about six or eight years. And those, uh, they were really suffering at the time. I. I didn't have any compassion for them, but uh, in, you know, after 65 years, you look back and uh, you can feel some compassion for them. How, what, how did they feel about all of you coming into their area? I, I, they, what they would do to a great extent is depend on us, I think, for, for handouts of food and whatnot. Almost when, for when survival. A, yeah. And, uh, I think they was, they probably hated us, I don't know, but uh, they had um, no other way to, uh, no way to express it really, because they were too beaten down and we... Uh, what about in France, in Belgium, was it the same way there too? Well, no, the, the Fr French and Belgians were very friendly and... Uh, and of course, uh, our supply depots in those countries, I think, must have been supplying them with a lot of food. That was one of the impressions that I never lost was I couldn't understand how someone at the very top of the government could figure out how to get all of the food and ammunition and uh, weaponry, vehicles and everything over there. Uh, when you think of the, the logistical support that is needed to maintain an army, it, it's mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. And that some people could figure out how to do this is uh, really fascinating. And I, uh, it's, uh, I don't know how they did it. <laughs> so. mm -hmm. Did you work side-by-side uh, -side with uh, commanders or admirals that historically have made a name for themselves? Did you meet any well, of them? our commanding general was uh, General Ridgway, and at that time he was a two-star general. And I, uh, certainly as a second lieutenant, I did not work side by side with him. I rarely saw him. Uh, but he became, of course, the, the commander in Korea in fact, when he came back, we were still in France awaiting transportation back to the United States. And uh, we got a telegram that he had made his third star. So and then he made his fourth star. And, uh, but the, uh, and some of his staff, uh, I was with the headquarters company. Now, a, a, a high headquarters such as Corps uh, they, they have tremendous responsibilities for divisions and everything else, but to look after the people in a corps headquarters you, or a division headquarters or anything, you have a, a headquarters company. And I was in the headquarters company, so that my area of uh, in, uh, interest was only the headquarters uh, of, of the corps, nothing about any of the divisions. But some of those people, after the war, they ended up in Washington and in relatively high positions. And, uh, and uh, so. So having gone to paratrooper training, did you utilize that experience or that expertise at all when you were in Europe? No. Mm -hmm. it, uh, no, we, we <laughs> uh, People have the idea that paratroopers are always jumping out of the plane, but basically we're, 
were infantrymen, and the only part of the airborne means is you get from point A to point B sometimes by air sure. instead of on uh, overland. But once, once you're all on the ground, you're just like every other inf infantryman. And, uh, so while you're over there, it's, it's getting to be the end of the war. Were you over there during the end of the war in Europe? Yes. Yeah. What, what do you remember about that? Well, it's, uh, I, I spent a lot of my time on reconnaissance, and uh, as I mentioned, there were pockets of uh, resistance. And the, the Waffen, FS, Waffen SS, uh, those SS troops took a vow that they would never surrender unless ordered to by a, an, a German officer. And those, sometimes you'd find clumps of those anywhere from a half a dozen to maybe a, a few dozen. And uh, so uh, when they were located, then uh, people in the higher echelons would would take care of that, and uh, but uh, in in what way? Hmm? In what way? Well, they would they had, had captured officers too, mm -hmm. and uh, we did, and uh, and I understand what they would do is take these officers and and uh, through loudspeakers and all, you know, have them uh, notify these clusters of SS men that. That the war was was over, and for them to surrender, and uh, they'd identify themselves and speak German. I I never saw any of it, but I was told that's how it was handled. How long did you stay in Europe? Uh, I think the total it, it was five months. What was your weather like while you were there? Very cold. At we were there, uh, it didn't even start to warm up, I think, until May, and, uh, but, uh... Were you dressed appropriately? Yes, we were, and, uh, <coughs> and initially it was extremely cold, around February, March or something, but the, uh, the, probably the, the most shocking thing that, uh, on, there was a concentration camp in Ludwig, Ludwig's Lust, and uh, and I can't. I was trying to remember what uh, my role was there, but I think it was units of the 82nd Airborne Division that uh, liberated it. And I can remember being there, but the and uh, you were at the camp during the liberation. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, our, you know, during, they had already gone in, but I, it was the bodies and everything was still there. That people were still coming out of the the buildings, and we were going through the buildings and seeing these naked bodies stacked up against the wall like cordwood. And uh, and at the time, you don't really. Think that much about it because these people you know, had nothing to do with us. And uh, today, if you saw something like that, it would be mind-boggling. But after you've seen a, you know, some of the devastation and death, you don't think that much about it. I don't think. I don't know. I think you become a little numb. A little hardened by it, and almost out of necessity. Do you think? I th yeah, I imagine. And uh, and I, one of the things I remember is that is these people were coming out of the, I guess you'd call them barracks, when they realized that uh, the Americans were there, the German guards had already left, and uh, but they, you know, would want to take your hand, shake hands, or something, and and some of them, most of them, were so weak they couldn't stand anyway, and. But of course, we always had gloves. We had our, we were in field uniform, and and, uh, and I, no, I put on my gloves because you didn't want to touch these people, mm. and so you, there was a little bit of revulsion in there, and not much compassion, unfortunately. 
and were these, after the fact, did you realize, were these um, individuals from Germany or other areas, and were they of? Most of them were other areas. And, and were uh, they mostly Jewish, or you didn't no, know at that time? No, uh, Germany uh, shipped most of its Jewish prisoners uh, into Poland, and uh, most of the camps in Germany I, I learned just a few years ago, they had something like 115 of them, which staggers me. But the, uh, they were mostly non-Jewish. And uh, in this, uh, in Ludwig's list. How do you, do you know how to spell that? Well, Ludus? it's Ludwig. Ludwig, and okay. And then Lust. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. One word. And, uh, but the, uh, but they had uh, used uh, bulldozers to dig a huge mass grave. They and meaning the Germans or no, the I, army? The army. Mm -hmm. And uh, but we took the, the German civilians out of the town. This is on the edge of town. And made everyone in the, in the town come out and walk around this uh, burial pit. <coughs> there were hundreds of bodies, and uh, we could only put them in crosswise. And, and, and I, the people at the time said they had no idea this was going on, and of course we didn't believe them, but in retrospect, it's quite possible that they didn't because they probably were not allowed to go near the place, and uh, there weren't any of the uh, uh, ovens or anything there. So, and and from the outside and probably from the air, it looked like any army establishment, you know, with the barracks and everything. So, did most of them die of starvation? Yes, I think so, because they were, uh, it, 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 they were indescribably skinny. Uh, you could see their ribs and, and some of them in the stomach, the stomach. And I, I find, you know, you, oftentimes your memory plays tricks and you remember things that didn't exist. So, uh, but I can remember, uh, and I told people afterwards that some of them, that their stomach from their rib cage, this, it was all concave, and you could actually see this, the spinal column, which means there was nothing in between. I don't know where their organs were, but uh, and their facial, um, their faces. I thought at the time, because they were so dehydrated and starved that they couldn't close their eyes and their mouths at the same time because there wasn't enough skin there. And it sounds ridiculous, but uh, you'd, you'd have to see it. And uh, it, it was just a, a, just a terrible thing. But after they were, were put into the graves, the mass graves, they erected crosses and a star of David. Now, the Europeans, the European men, the only ones who are circumcised were Jews. And uh, of the crosses and the stars of David, there were about 12 to 15 crosses for every star of David. And at the time we were hearing about the mass murder of the Jews, but because, you know, our area of interest is only about what you can see around you. It was hard to think that, well, maybe that isn't so because uh, it doesn't show, show here. But, but because they, the Germans had moved most of the Jewish prisoners out of Germany, that uh, left uh, Poles, Ukrainians, Russians, French, everything. And, uh, but those who survived uh, and Again, I don't know who does this, but they had little, probably one inch square tabs to put on their clothes, and it, it had carried the flag or the color of the nation that they were from. 
and uh, and we we used to kid with them. And another thing that was amazing is that these people had to be carried in, and we were uh, in Hagenau, and a couple of the schools were turned into uh, hospitals of rehab. Uh, uh, places for these survivors of the concentration camp. And my gosh, these people had to be carried in and two or three days later, they were insisting on leaving and they would leave. And uh, the resilience of the human body is tremendous. I never saw anything like it. And uh, I just hope they all got back to where they were going. But mm -hmm. uh, they, they were very anxious to get back to France or wherever they had come from. Of Poland, and they had a lot of Polish prisoners there. So, but did your unit help with closing that camp, Ludwig Lust down? Well, the uh, the eighty second Airborne Division and I think the hundred and first, and there are a couple of other divisions were all under Corps, under Eighteenth Airborne Corps, so that. Uh, General Ridgway, I'm sure, was uh, uh, was probably was in charge of that. Yeah, you I think? think I think mm -hmm. he probably commanded everything there. But uh, it's it's just amazing the responsibilities that these generals have and, and their staffs too. They, they have to be great. So. Having seen that, and you, and you said earlier in this conversation that, that you almost, I think my words, and I didn't want to put words in your mouth, but that you almost had to be hardened to what you were seeing. Mm. Since that time, we've all seen some of the newsreels or the photos, and, and as you said, as you get older, you think differently. Has it been more shocking to you as you've gotten older to, to realize what you experienced, what you saw over there? Yeah, I'm not sure the word is shocking. I think that uh, as you get older and, uh, and, uh, and hopefully a little wiser, I think you can compute it a little better and uh, put it in its right perspective. How long then did you stay in Europe before you came home? Uh, we, we, after the German surrender, it seems to be we were in Germany about a, a month or so. And then we went back into France awaiting uh, transportation home, because of course everyone was leaving. and. Uh, the ships would have to go in, and, and, I, and I frankly can't even remember where we were, but I, maybe we went back to Cherbourg, I, don't, I can't remember. But uh, they had uh, different camps where we'd be located awaiting transportation, and they had the names of the, the cigarettes, and they had uh, Chesterfield, and I was in Camp Lucky Strike, <laughs> and, uh, and in fact, we used to get cigarettes in our rations, which today I'm sure they don't. <laughs> true, and, true. Uh, yeah. So that, uh, and those uh, who didn't smoke learned to smoke in the army, and uh, and, I, and I still smoke. So. And yeah. at at Camp Lucky Strike, did you take a ship back home? Yes. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you to get home? Oh, well, I think I think we waited about a month, uh, and I think what happened is they uh, they would take the the combat troops that were going back, and they gave them priority and justifiably so, and uh, and because we were not front line troops, why uh, they. Uh, we we came back as a corps and the uh, corps headquarters and it, it uh, I think I was there about a month and it was the most boring existence and uh, and and when you have troops you if they're not kept busy they get into mischief 
Mm -hmm. And keeping them busy was a very difficult thing. And that was part of your responsibility yeah. as one of the officers, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that we finally did get a ship and got back. And uh, we were going to uh, redeploy to Japan then because this was, I guess it was July of 45. But then we were given a month at uh, rec uh, uh, of leave and recreation. Mm -hmm. And uh, the day I reported back to the post, I had to report back to, in fact, it was Massachusetts up here at Camp Devons. And uh, the day I reported back there to get back under Army control, why, uh, as I was getting out of the cab, <laughs> The, the news came over that Japan had surrendered. So, but we were still going to go over on occupational duty. And we went back to, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, to uh, Camp Campbell, Kentucky. But uh, they had a point system in those days that for every month you spent in the United States in, in service, you got one point. And for everyone overseas, you got two points. So, and you needed, I forget how many points, mm -hmm. maybe 55 points, and then you could get out. Well, <coughs> by the time we got back, a lot of our men had a sufficient number of points to, to get out. And uh, With you, did the points include your time at Annapolis, do you think? Well, it's... Uh, I, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I never... Uh, Did you have enough points to get out at that point? I think so, uh -huh. but uh, I didn't... I had no intention of getting out. And, uh, Did you want to make this a career? Yes, I thought so. So you were in Kentucky. Yeah. Your group was disassembling. And what did you do? Well, I disassembled with them. That's when I was transferred to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Uh, to the uh, 82nd Airborne, after because they had come back in the meantime also, but, and uh, that's when I was assigned to the Inspector General's department and at at Fort, Fort Bragg. Bragg. And yeah. so, at this point, could you bring your family with you? Yes. Yeah. At that at that time, I think I only had a wife. I didn't have children. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't have any children at that time. So. And how long did you stay at Fort Bragg? <laughs> 45, 46. Well, I'm trying to think. It was from Fort Bragg I volunteered for flight training, and I'm trying to work backwards now. Yeah. But it... Uh, and flight training because as a paratrooper you you thought what you might want to be a pilot or? yeah I, uh, up until that time uh, only field artillery officers could be be army pilots and at that time they don't do what they do now but it, they were observation to you know to zero in on field artillery but at, at that that point in 19, I'm trying to think, 45, 46, I guess, uh, they opened it up to infantry and engineering officers also. Uh, I don't know of any engineering officers that went through flight training, but uh, a number of us who were infantry did, did go through. And uh, where did you do your flight training? Uh, our basic flight training was in uh, San Marcos, Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we finished that, we got our advanced flight training in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And was it the thrill of flying that you liked, or you just this was like the next step in your mind for your career? Well, it's, it's, it's I, I, probably a little of everything, and it's just something else to do, and... Uh, and I, I thought uh, along the way, too, it'd be a lot nicer to go up in a plane and land in a plane instead of going <laughs> up in a plane and, and jumping, jumping out. out. And uh, 
uh, for uh, paratroopers got an extra hundred dollars, the officers got a, an extra hundred dollars a month pay. And, uh, Which back then was a lot of money. Oh yeah, uh, I'm trying to remember our basic pay and that was only about $150 or something. At this point, what was your uh, rank? I was, by now, I was first lieutenant. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that the, uh, and so flight pay would, in fact, I think flight pay was like $105 for first lieutenant. And uh, so that means I could do something else and not lose any money. And, uh, and I, I did think that I could pass the eye exam for flight training, but I just thought, well, they'll send me into Texas or somewhere for, for evaluation and it'll give me a few days off anyway, because uh, the, the Inspector General's department is responsible for uh, every, probably every, it can't be every year, but every now and then you have to have a, every division has to have a Inspector General's general inspection, and uh, and that takes weeks to do. Every every company in the organization has to be in, uh, audited, and uh, our inspect. I I work. There were only two officers. There was a the, the, a lieutenant colonel was the in charge. He was the Inspector General. I was a deputy as a first lieutenant, and then we had a warrant officer who was like an office manager. And I think we had six, six enlisted men. And we had to conduct this general inspection or an audit of everything. And it was exhausting. How many uh, units are tr tr oh my gosh. would you be inspecting? Uh, it would be at the, at the whole fort, is that what it would no, be? No, well, be your division. Your division. Yeah, 82nd Airborne Division, and, and I, I really can't remember, and I'm... So are we talking... So when you say you, as the Deputy Inspector General, you would go out and do an audit where? Well, you'd go to a, a, each company uh -huh. and... Uh, a couple of the men, I, I didn't do the actual audit. I sort of supervised it. Sure. And, uh, but our men would go there and they would go through all of the records in the supply department. And it was basically a supply thing because uh, the rest of it was under the, the command of, you know, whoever the uh, regimental commander was. And so that... Uh, but uh, and, but they were graded according to our inspection, and so we were not welcome in most places. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, but it uh, it took a lot of time and, and it, uh, a lot of concentration, and so we were tired. And <coughs> after we finished that, why then I this thing had come about on flight training, and I thought, boy, I need a few days off, so. That's uh, what I applied for, and I, I wasn't too optimistic about passing the eye part, eye exam. So, but uh, I, 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 the little secret was that one of the men that had been in my unit in uh, in Germany was had evidently gotten out of the army and then had re-enlisted in the air force. So when I went down to, and I can't even remember where it was, some air, airfield in Texas, uh, to go through the examination there and the eye exam with the air officer, uh, he was a corporal and he gave the eye exam. And my problem was lack of depth perception. And, but uh, he made sure that I passed that too. And as a result, I, Ended up going through flight training, and <coughs> and and until the very end, it, uh, my small problem in vision wasn't detected. But the air officer at that time uh, said, "Well, if I could have gone through all of that training and hadn't killed myself, well, probably I could continue." So, sure. so he passed me with the uh, 
But after that, I had to wear, uh, on my certification, it said that I had to wear glasses while flying. So I had to make sure that I, I had glasses. So I had, we used to have what they call the Air Force dark glasses, and I had prescription put into those. And, and I, used, I told all the associates around me, I said, if I ever get in a crash, I said, make sure that I've got my glasses on <laughs> when they find my body. So, and, uh, so you passed your training. Yeah, yeah. And where did you go then from there? Well, that's when I went over to Korea. As, uh, and what year was that? That was 1947, late 47. And what did you do in Korea? Well, I was assigned to the uh, 32nd, I think it was the 32nd Division, but we all flew out of uh, one air airfield over there. And it, we, uh, we were assigned to what they call for, uh, for, for, for uh, you have to be assigned to someone, so mm -hmm. they assigned us. and. But our, we had an air section that functioned by itself. And, uh, and what were you doing over there? Well, at that time we were uh, actually acting at somewhat as a taxi service when uh, officials had to be, had to go from point A to point B, maybe from Seoul. We were uh, stationed right outside of Seoul on an island in the Han River called Yung Dung Po, and uh, we would fly from there into south into Kunsan and all. And, and uh, so, would you be flying uh, the upper echelon of the of your army? Yeah, most. All, well, all, yeah, yeah, they would be. Uh, a, a lot of times, they, uh, the people that I would fly would be court stenographers or court officers, and they would have to go to one of the uh, other posts for court marshals. And for those who might be in prison? Yeah, that were from you know, found guilty, of, well, not found guilty, but at least being charged with something. So they'd have to go before a court marshal, and these people, these officers were the court officers. Now, would this be for court marshals for the Japanese or for the no, U.S. U U.S. So personnel. someone who personnel who got in trouble doing something. Yeah, and uh, and also we we flew. Uh, we were trying to uh, at that time they were trying to unify Korea and uh, and democratize South Korea, and we would fly uh, pamphlets, uh, propaganda pamphlet pamphlets telling them how to vote and everything. And of course, the Koreans had never been exposed to that. It's like a lot of nations, you, you look to someone to tell you what to do. And uh, they couldn't understand because they were not trained in government or anything, why they should be, why they should be counted on to, be, to vote. And uh, it seemed odd to us who had grown up with that democracy. But uh, the 38th parallel, which divided North Korea from South Korea went across a body of water and uh, so that it was very difficult to get it. But we had troops on the Anjin Peninsula, which is west of the mainland, and we had a post there. But it, the vehicular traffic could only go there, I, I can't remember, limited time, no more than maybe once a week or once a month or something. And all the time, the, the North Koreans, and which we always considered were the Russians, but the North Koreans would follow along on a, on a parallel road with their, their guns pointed at you. So that they had limited access because those vehicles had to go up into technically North Korea for a short distance to get to the Anjin Peninsula. And uh, so we would fly uh, people into Anjin, we'd fly mail and everything else. And uh, so now this is all before the conflict. Yes, it so was. So it was all leading up to the Korean conflict. It was 47, 48. 48. And, uh, 
Now, while you're in Korea, is your wife back at Fort Bragg? No, she's in, her folks were in California at the time, and she was there, and uh, we had had one daughter by then. And, uh, but she had a, a son while I was in Korea, and, uh, and that was, she had some medical problems with him, and that's when I came home. I was sent home on emergency leave. And that's when I came to the conclusion that, you know, I, I couldn't be just uh, enjoying myself in the Army and uh, leaving her all the responsibility of the family. So I decided I'd better resign, go back to college, and start earning an honest living. So, so you resigned from the service when? Yeah. Do you remember? Uh, I, th I think it was July of 1948. Uh, and back to Bates, is that where you went? Yes, I went back to Maine. And, and what was your degree in? I have a degree in government, uh, and uh, which, which is a, actually the people who intended to be lawyers used, took a degree, government as, uh, a pre-law preparation, but uh, by the time I had uh, finished, I had used up most of our savings, and, uh, and I thought it was time for me to get a job. Before we talk about your job, let's talk a little bit about at what rank did you complete your service? I was a captain in the reserve when I got out, and uh, and then when I went back to base, I was in the National Guard as a captain also. So. And how long were you in the National Guard? Well, f well, three and a half. Years, well, forty-eight to fifty-one. Well, probably three and a half years until I left Maine. And when I left Maine, then. I was separated from the National Guard. When you came home, you were so open with, with us in this discussion about what you saw in the camps in Germany. When you came home, did you discuss with your family or friends your experiences, or did you just sort of get on with it? No, I think there was a lot of discussion. Uh, of course. When I got back in '48, an awful lot of fellows who had been in the service and who had gotten out, you know, some of them got out in probably 1945, 46. And, right. And uh, so that uh, among us, you always say, "Well, where were you? And mm -hmm. what did you do?" And and uh, so then we tell each other stories and exaggerate when we can. And, <laughs> Did you join any veterans organizations? <laughs> no, I did not. I, uh, uh, one of the fellows that I knew in college and became friendly belonged to the, uh, one of the veterans organizations in Lawston. And he uh, thought I should belong. And it's a great bunch of fellows. And they're all World War II vets. And so uh, they, I, I suppose it was one evening at, couldn't have been during the day because when I went back to Bates, I I still needed money, so I, I went back. To, I still worked again part time with Pepperell, which was a godsend. And uh, now, what is Pepperell? Pepperell Manufacturing, and, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's a uh, you know when you're raising a young family, it, you have to do that. And uh, so, but I went there uh, to this hall. And these fellows were sitting, <laughs> sitting around these card tables, and some were playing cards and drinking beer, and some were doing both. And I thought, my God, what a dumb thing to do, you know, that uh, to spend all this time and be non-productive. And uh, and I, uh, I had, you know, drunk when I uh, was in the army, and but I had stopped and. I, along the way, I realized this is not the way to go, and also it it, it didn't agree with me. So, 
so I've been a teetotaler for the last 60 or 65 years, but the uh, but I and I didn't like gambling, so I thought if yeah, they're drinking beer, I don't drink beer, and they're gambling, and I don't like gambling, so so I I I did not join, and it wasn't until I, I guess it was about 20 years ago in New Bedford, uh, one of the fellows that I knew quite well was uh, very active in the American Legion. And one, one Christmas, for Christmas present, he gave me a membership in the American Legion. And uh, so for the last 20 some years, <coughs> I've been sending dues into the American Legion. But and, you uh, don't go to their meetings? Hmm? But you don't go to their meetings? Or no, no. Did you receive veterans benefits or did you go back to school with the GI Bill? Under the GI Bill, mm -hmm. which was a godsend and, uh, for a lot of us. And, uh, did you attend any reunions of your old outfit? No, I did not. Talk about what you did after Bates. <laughs> you moved to Massachusetts? Yeah, I moved to New Bedford and, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I represented the the, the vessel owners and the, the fishing industry really in New Bedford and on a national, state and national level too and, and uh, at congressional hearings and all. It was a very heady time and uh, that's when we got the Salt and Stall Kennedy bill passed and uh, got a lot of things going and Boston was a, an active fishing port and had good representation, and Gloucester was an active port and had good representation, but New Bedford did not. And uh, but uh, with the education and background that I had, then we became sort of on a par with Boston and Gloucester, <coughs> and uh, so we got a lot of a lot of things done and. Uh, and I stayed with them for seven and a half years, and then I was recruited to go to uh, Korea, of all places, as a fisheries advisor for the State Department of the U.S. Aid Program. And so I signed a contract with them and took my family over there and spent two years in Korea. But then... Uh, Did the kids... How old were the kids at that point? Well, they were, uh, I guess, sort of grammar school level. So did they go to an international school over there? Well, they had, a, uh, they had enough Americans over there, so an army, and they went to the uh, American school on the army base. Mm -hmm. We lived on the army base. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but uh, but it, I came back to the States and uh, wasn't sure what I was going to do because I didn't come back to any job, but I wasn't particularly worried. And uh, I found out that uh, they, they had established a uh, Harbor Development Commission in New Bedford, uh, but had run it out of the mayor's office for a couple of few, or few years. And, but they decided to have a director, and so they figured I would be back in a two or three months, so they held the position open until I got back to see if I would take it, and, and uh, I was so flattered by that that uh, I, I did take it, and it was a, a good challenge, too. And, and how long were you there for? I, I stayed in that for three years until uh, urban renewal came in, and they uh, sort of encroached on the waterfront. Uh, and since it was a federal uh, organization and everything, uh, it would have meant, and it did mean that the Harbor Development Commission then would take a subservient role. And I wasn't ready for that, so I uh, had been approached by a, a Norwegian uh, fish processing company to go with them. And uh, the fellow that was the CEO in the United States for the company uh, and I had oftentimes taken different positions in congressional hearings in Washington on, 
on tariffs and imports, etc. But he was the one that wanted me to go to work for him, and uh, and I did, and uh, became the operations officer and moved their plant from uh, Mobile, Alabama, to New Bedford, and. Uh, which so. was certainly convenient for you. Yeah. <laughs> so were you back and forth to Washington a lot? Yes, yeah. Throughout both the... Well, uh, when, when I represented the fishing industry, I was there a lot, sometimes maybe a couple of times in one week. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd go up there sometimes in the morning and come back at night because there was so much to do. and I sort of ran a one-man office, so I couldn't delegate it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it, it, it was all so interesting and so exciting, and I, had, I was young enough and had enough energy to keep up with it, and I enjoyed it. And uh, also in the plant, uh, we put up a plant in New Bedford, and I was given the responsibilities for uh, assisting the uh, contract engineer, architectural engineers, and had a lot with setting that up and moving some of the equipment up to New Bedford from Alabama, and uh, and that was interesting also. And uh, but uh, but then that after we got the plant up and going, and you know, I you know I, I got a, a little bored again, <laughs> and. Uh, one of our, our main customer was next door and uh, was a uh, cold storage and freezing and cold storage plant. And uh, we, we had a very close relationship. In fact, the, the freezer and cold storage plant furnished the refrigeration for, for our processing plant. So, but then this two CEOs couldn't you know, they got to the point they couldn't get along with each other, and uh, so I was hired by the coal stores, and so I was sort of the the the, the liaison there. The peacemaker. Yeah. Hmm? The peacemaker. Yeah, or, or keeping them apart anyway. Sure. And uh, so, but uh, to, to you know, it's not really proper to go from one plant to another with such a close relationship. And I'd been getting calls from Washington to go to different places and uh, as a consultant and, you know, for short periods. But I, I would never say no, but I would give them a price tag that I knew they wouldn't meet. And, uh, but then when I needed to have a bridge from one plant to the other and so right about that time, they wanted me to go down into the Dominican Republic on a, uh, had to do with the Peace Corps. And I think this was like 1962 or three. And uh, so I went down there and I took two men with me uh, that knew more about certain factors of the fisheries than I did. And uh, I think we were there for, maybe three weeks or something, and uh, then came back and wrote up a report, and that was the end of Then I went to the cold storage plant, and so I was with them for six, six or seven years, and, and, uh, so you... and, and somewhere along the line, I went down into Brazil. So oh, you it... had quite a reputation with the fishing industry then that your reputa reputation brought you not only throughout the U.S., but throughout yeah. other areas, too. Yeah, and when I was leaving uh, the cold storage plant, uh, Washington wanted me to go down into Brazil for three months, and I told him that's a long time. And, uh, but I, I, I did go down, and uh, I replaced a fellow who had been assassinated down there Ooh. by uh, one of his helpers. And, and uh, the idea was to go into the interior and figure out a way to get the, the fish from the uh, huge reservoirs into, onto the coast. And uh, so I, I did that, and they had a uh, a USAID program there, so 
that, uh, that everything fit fit together quite well. But I finished uh, I, what I could do in in two months, and I I, I told them that <coughs> I couldn't do any more. Uh, that for my staying, they would waste my time and waste the government's money. So, so I came back to the states and and uh, went to the, went to work with the with the federal government as a, uh, who they were having trouble with the fishing and with the fishing industry and uh, they were battling each other and so they had a big inve investigation and all and so they had set up a uh, a panel and uh, or some something so they came to the conclusion what they needed was a a liaison officer between the government and the uh, the fishing industry to act as a as a conduit for information going in both directions and to try to relieve some of the tension that was going on and I was recommended from for that by a, a few a few organizations or something and so I I I took it that I intended to be there only temporarily, but uh, it was a fascinating job for quite a while. Where was your, was it uh, in uh, New Bedford? Yeah, then? I functioned out of New Bedford, mm -hmm. but my headquarters was Gloucester, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is where the district headquarters was, and I did, reported directly to the, to the district uh, the director. and. Uh, and the district covers everything from uh, the Great Lakes to uh, Florida and the, all up the coast. So it's a big chunk of land and a lot of the coastal area. So it's fascinating. It, it was, and I, as a result, I stayed there for 12 years instead of just a, a temporary few years. And, uh, Do you feel, looking at all of this, I see? a real leadership role. Do you feel that the leadership training that you received in your service helped in your um, non-military career? Oh, I'm sure it did. And uh, both at, at Annapolis and both and Army, and particularly in the officers' training, and uh, where you are trained to command troops and uh, my uh, MOS, which is a military occupational specialty in Army language, is uh, was always unit commander. In other words, you, you, your qualification is for commanding troops. And I never actually had a platoon, uh, you know, in a not regular organization except in training. And uh, but I always maintained that, and uh, and I. I'm sure that uh, that gives you some experience in uh, personnel. I don't. I'm not sure what the word is in management or, or people management and whatnot. And uh, I think all a lot of that indoctrination is very subtle. You don't realize that you're learning along the way, but it, uh, a lot of things came in handy. And after you know, have, having troops under your control to have other people under control, not under control, but under mm -hmm. supervision. Mm -hmm. That's a bad word, control. How important to you was serving in the military? Oh, I think it was great. I, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I just, uh, I like the military because it's orderly and you know where you stand, you know where everyone else stands, and uh, and uh, sometimes it's, you can have a commanding officer that is a real pain in the neck, but you know it's only temporary because sooner or later either you're going to move or he's going to move. So you can you know, withstand it. And, uh, and, it's, uh, and you know, there are firm laws to operate by. You don't get into the politics that you do in civilian life. And uh, it's... Uh, I, I, I enjoyed it, and, uh, and I think because of that, because of, maybe because of the orderliness and, 
uh, you know, you, in civilian life, you meet people, you don't know what their backgrounds are. In army life, all you have to do is look at their chest and you know where they've been and what they've done. Sure. And, uh, so it's a, uh, it's, it's, it's a very neat system. And, uh, do you feel, or do you, looking back at all of your experiences in the, in the military, was there any one experience or person or incident that comes to mind that whether it be humorous or sensitive or anything in particular that I, I think I think the the one thing that I, you, know, you don't spend your your time thinking back at least I didn't and but the probably the one thing I've thought of more than any other is that, that the deprivation of the people in, in, in Ludus list and what the Germans did to these people. And uh, it's something I could never understand and never will, how one human being can treat other, another human being so poorly. It's just, uh, I don't know how you do that. It's, uh, it's, so that really stayed with you? Yeah, the, the implications of it have. and. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it just, uh, you know, that was an experience I had. Uh, but I'll tell you one thing that often boggled my mind and still does is uh, if you're a low-ranking officer and you have to take men into danger, then you don't feel badly about it because you're part of it. But I often wondered how these generals can send troops into harm's way, knowing that a bunch of them are going to be killed, and uh, and you you must have to erase this from your mind. And and when you think of Eisenhower and the invasion, and they anticipated ten thousand dead. Of course, fortunately, there were not that many. But you know what kind of. Uh, uh, steel do you have to have in your body to, to give the order knowing that maybe up to 10,000 men are going to be killed. These generals uh, live a nice life, but boy, they really deserve it. So Cause they had to make some very serious oh, decisions. Tremendous. Is there anything else as we finish up this interview that you'd like to add any comments to not only your family, but those who will be watching this interview that you'd like to leave us with? I can't think of anything. I can't think of why anyone would watch it anyway. But <laughs> Well, you've had quite an experience in your life, not only in your military life, but in your private life. And John F. Linehan, we'd like to thank you for coming in today and sharing those experiences with us. Well, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. <laughs>